Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one. Hey, Julie, we're back, and it is my brother's birthday. So happy birthday, John, if you're listening. It's August 12th, and we have a fun show for you guys today. Yes. One, This is another one of those shows that are uh, from uh, all of you asking us uh, for specific help, or at least when we start seeing more and more emails where people or agents are asking us the same thing, then obviously we pivot our podcast to talk about what it is that will be of most service to you guys. Because if we get 10 or 20 emails or you know comments all kind of saying the same thing, it's probably meaning that thousands of you are having the same issue. So this is one of uh, Julie's specialties. It's one of the most common topics, obviously, inside of our Premier Coaching Program, at least for the last few years. I kind of doubt if it's going to be a common, popular topic over the next few years, but for now it certainly is. And the topic is? Topic du jour, how to actually win the, the house for your buyers. That's right. How to be the winning accepted contract. That's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to drill down. Julie has five points she's ready to uh, read to you guys. We're going to go through, as we always do on our podcast, we're going to be very quick and concise, very practical and tactical, so be ready to take notes. And I also want to remind all of you that if you'd like to join our free coaching program, we planned it only uh, ha- making that available for 90 days, but we're going to continue to make that available to everybody in the country. You don't have to have any particular broker affiliation or anything. As a matter of fact, yeah, this is kind of fun news, we're going to start formalizing our ability to coach agents in different countries. Um, obviously, we have clients in uh, Canada, but we also have a lot of clients in uh, literally in uh, Italy and Germany and, well, by, I mean, a lot of listeners, no coaching clients. I should be very specific about that um, because uh, that's going to be where we're going to start focusing on international expansion. So as we say that, this free coaching program is available to everybody, regardless of brand affiliation or country of origin. How about that? Yes. All you have to do is text the word SURVIVAL to 31996. Text the word SURVIVAL to 31996. And when you do, we're going to text you back a link. Now, you've got to activate your free membership. It isn't just done for you. You've got to set up a username and a password. And then you're entitled to a whole bunch of stuff, including, I mean, there's Honestly, guys, there's what, I think maybe 10 books in there, 10 guides, rather. Um, You also have access to the daily free coaching, uh, I'm sorry, the daily coaching, uh, semi-private coaching session with one of our coaches. That's free. So I'm going to get, I'm going to say this, um, and you have to do this urgently. It doesn't matter where you are. Go ahead and text the word SURVIVAL to 31996. Text the word SURVIVAL to 31996. It seems that so many of the international real estate markets are all sort of following the same pattern because, after all, it does seem that, for the most part, we do have an international economy. We're seeing a lot of the different countries that Julie and I study and where we have podcast listeners. As we're getting to know all of you guys around the globe better, we're noticing that your markets are essentially mirroring ours or maybe ours are mirroring yours. So thank you for discovering us and thank you for allowing us to be your coaches along the path to your continued real estate success. So go ahead and text the word survival to 31996. Mrs. Harris? Yes. So how do you get your contract accepted as the number one and beat everybody else out? This is something that most of you are dealing with. Some of you are dealing with it virtually every day of your lives. So point number one, well, really kind of mini mindset point. If you're just hoping that you win, that is not a strategy. There is an art and science to this and you do have to work on it. So those of you who listen and just hope that somehow you're going to luck out, The more you lose for that client, the more likely they are to fire you. They expect you to work this hard to get this for them. That's why they hired you. And you guys will find uh, that buyers will fire you if you are not getting a house for them or if you're at least not getting in the running. Um, So you got to pay very close attention to this. Obviously, our focus on our coaching program is in teaching you guys how to be powerful listing agents. So frankly, you don't have to deal with any of the insanity out there that so many of you guys are having to, you know, work within because of the hot sellers market that still exists in most of the country. And by the way, a lot of parts of the world, same type of market. Um, But yeah, if you want to get on the other side of that where you don't have to be constantly on your heels 
definitely focus on being a listing agent. You, but you will be working with buyers. We always, even our most successful coaching clients, we always suggest, you know, it does not matter. You could have 50 fantastic listings. We always want you to have at least two or three strong buyers that you're working with. You know, buyers that are going to be motivated to buy, not time wasters, because those are the, that's the best way for you to stay on top of the market. So yes, of course, we want you to work with buyers. And as you build a big listing business, one of the things we'll suggest you do is look into referring those buyers off that have no houses to sell. So, you know, you want to run them through a gauntlet where you're pre-qualifying them, pulling out the sellers, you know, that are actually presenting as buyers. You get those listings listed and then the buyers that uh, don't have anything to sell or even the buyers that do have something to sell, consider referring those off. And in every single case where I've ever done the math, you're going to make more net profit referring those buyer leads off to individual agents in your marketplace or your office versus having them on your team. Just for whatever uh, reason, a lot of you guys don't understand that. If you want to have a private conversation with me about that, just go ahead and text me directly at 512-758-0206. But the moral of the story is the most profitable agents in the country are always listing agents. And the, frankly, what a lot of them are doing is they are generating buyer leads from all their lists but they're referring those buyer leads out for sometimes as much as 40%, which will ultimately net them more profit than if they had a buyer agent on their team that they're sending that same lead to. Interesting tidbit, interesting fact for all of you who are thinking about building a team to ponder. Julie? That's right. There's another strategy that some of our top listing agents are doing, and that is hiring a showing agent whose only job is to show. You're obviously not going to give them a very big piece of the pie, but if the client uh, does buy something they should, they usually get a little kicker. So That came out of the need to jump on the newest inventory. And a lot of times the listing agents are, you know, starved for time. So that's another strategy. Okay, so number one, you must talk to the listing agent before you write the contract. The script is simple. Aside from price, what else is important to your seller? That's critical, okay? Agents complain, well, I can't find the listing agent. Find the listing agent, okay? (laughs) Text, show up to their office, call them, haunt them. This is a a case where it's okay to stalk them, okay? Find the listing agent. And so what other things are common? Right now, the hot thing is flexibility and closing date. Yep. So is it important for the seller to be contingent on finding suitable housing? And for how long? Is it important for them to lease back? And at what rate? You know, if your buyer is willing to give flexibility then you know that's going to be an advantage to you. If they're not and they have a hard date, it may be the reason that you lose the contract. And there's an interesting little tidbit that Julie just threw out there. Oftentimes, and you guys don't think like this, but you should, price is not the most important thing to your client, neither your right. buyer or your seller. You think it is, but it's not, especially in a market like this. What matters most to the seller is the convenience. That's what they're looking for. Especially That's what now. they're they're paying for convenience. And what the buyer wants more than anything is they want the house, okay? Mm-hmm. So ultimately what you have to know is the true motivation of the listing of the seller whom you're trying to uh, you know seduce into accepting your offer from your buyer. Julie? Yes, that's right. And in fact, one of our great uh, coaching clients, John Walkinshaw in Canada, he's been able to craft some deals by really stretching out the solid deal, but he has like a four month closing cycle, a five month closing cycle so that the seller can either build or find something to buy. Everybody's solid and ratified. Everybody's financing is good, but he's been able to craft some deals by being that flexible. I mean, that's long. I don't really like hugely long closing dates, but he's doing the deals. Now he's doing that on the buyer side or the seller Both. side? Both. Depend- so he- when, when people are trying to shift and there's not enough inventory, they haven't found something yet, or the seller is building and they don't want to move twice. Sure. So if you are uh, presenting, and John Walkinshaw, I believe, is going to be the number one agent in Can- uh, in. Uh, Canada with EXP Realty. So congratulate, uh, congratulations, John, on that. Uh, time will tell, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be. Mm-hmm. But so if you're up in Canada and you're wanting to get one of John Walkinshaw's dozens of listings and contracts, why don't you call up John and why don't you find out exactly what his buyer wants? And Julie just gave you seller. a little bit of insight. Seller wants, and Julie just gave you a little insight. And guess what? Uh, John Walkinshaw is coached by Julie Harris. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thus we have strategy. Yeah, so flexibility is really big right now. And other things that you and I used to hear all the time, you know, it's not always price. It might be their stainless steel refrigerator. It has mm-hmm. to go with them. They get all attached to that. Hot tubs. We had somebody that wanted to move their pet graveyard once. I don't know if you remember oh that. Oh, my gosh. I do remember that. <laughs> yeah. So it could be something that you've not thought of yet. 
Right. Um, you know, anywhere from like window coverings and kids' play sets. How creepy would it have been yeah. if the buyer didn't want them to move the pet graveyard, that <laughs> they wanted to keep it? it. I know. I if, know. That, if the buyer thought that was a feature of the house. You cannot make this stuff up, right? <laughs> so ask the questions. Point number two. Point number two. Okay. Uh, lease back flexibility. We talked about that. Point number two is you must have a killer lender letter, including underwriting being done if at all possible. Right. And lenders are starting to comply with this actually because they lose business when, I mean, the lender doesn't get paid until they close either. So uh, there are a lot of lenders that are using that as a USP that they will now write a letter of pre approval saying that they are through underwriting contingent only on identifying the property and appraisal. USP being unique selling proposition. Thank you. Sorry. So on the website, guys, and we wrote this ultimate, what's it called, Julie? Ultimate. Addendum. I, ultimate addendum. addendum. The oh. ultimate addendum was written originally for listing agents to basically counter back to any contracts they got um, and basically making the lender drill down on that lender's letter to make sure it has no subject to's. And so I'm um, just bottom line, guys, lenders do not do anything really on any lent borrower's file until the house, until the borrower has, or the potential borrower has a house in contract. So for the most part, there will be no three merge credit report. There will be no verification of income, assets to close, anything. The borrower is essentially going to be then given a sort of boilerplate, useless lender's letter. Mm -hmm. Lender's letters in general, guys, are useless. Right. When you read a lender's letter, and I want you to read one, if you've got one in your file right now, it's going to start out, they always start out the same way. The first paragraph's the same thing. And then the second paragraph, sometimes the third paragraph, then they start slipping in the fact that they haven't really done anything on the borrower's file. It'll say subject to, it says sometimes it'll, the only subject to and verification of that you should be able to accept, and again, this is on our website, so download it. And just copy it. Use it for your the uh, behalf of your uh, you know protect your sellers if you're a listing agent, and use it when you're accepting lenders' letters or not accepting lenders' letters, so you know they've actually done their job. Um, and what the only thing a lenders' letter can be subject to, and again they use subject to is sometimes what verif what are all the little contingent on right subject to is uh, pending appraisal subject. of subject property. That's it. Well, Any sometimes they'll say identification of because they haven't actually found a property. It might read that. But you want to get rid of that as soon as possible. Right. Um, and that brings up another point, okay, which is sometimes, and it's really competitive, and I don't like these two things, but it will help you win. In certain cases, if they're comfortable, you can waive inspections and waive the appraisal to be competitive. Right. I'm are not we, in love are you with going that. to point three? Sure. Or, okay. So. Is that point three? Yeah. Okay. Well, so wrapping up point two, make sure you use the correct language. Uh, coaching clients, it's on the website. Download it, use it, and then you can use it for both yeah. sides of the transaction. Point number three, well, Julie. So that point was have a kick ass lender, not a lane right. lender. Okay. Point number three <laughs> is to summarize. Um, you may want to waive inspections and appraisal. It depends a lot on the client, whether they even have the chops to raise it, to waive the appraisal and, and to go over. Here's the irony of that. You can put that in the contract, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the lender is going to give a hoot about the fact that you said they're going to waive this and waive the other thing. Because if it's a government-backed mortgage, you're not going to get that loan. It's what, automatically contingent on appraisal. That's exactly right. So to write it in the letter or write it in the contract might make the seller and the listing agent feel good. But the reality of it is, is it's still going to have to go through some level of appraisal but what they're going what you could what could legitimately be argued is you did not make the sale of the property contingent on the subject appraisal or, or the appraisal or the um, you know home home inspection you know you got to be careful on that if the borrower is essentially uh, that confident in the property and they're willing to buy the property with a substantial down payment and they're going to put down enough money that the lender doesn't care if they're going to overpay for based on appraisal. Because remember, if they're getting a mortgage, the lender is going to appraise the house regardless of what the contract says. You're not going to remove that. Right. Now, if you have an all-cash buyer, then if they want to buy it without inspections, they want to buy it without appraisal. Julie, do you have anything in there about checking all-cash buyers? Make sure they're not full of it? Yes, that was the next point. Okay, so Julie's got next point number four. Make sure you're paying attention to this. Proof of funds, and Pro then it's real. It's not just, you know. Okay, so point number three, if you want to be extra aggressive and you're working with an extra aggressive buyer who has their other bases covered, you might want to waive all the things. 
do a complete risk reversal offer to the buyer or to the seller rather. You could tell, guys, I have a sort of a, a software issue with a, a, talking about buyers too frequently on our podcast. It gives me hives. That's the reason I always <laughs> screw those two words up. But here, the bottom line is if, if you're doing risk reversal, right, there's risk built into every contract. But the more risk you can remove from this uh, from the seller's perspective, the higher likelihood it is to get the contract accepted. Now, remember, and I'm going to say this again because that is critical. Very rarely does highest price win. It's all these other factors. And go back to Julie's point number one, which is essentially interrogating the listing agent, finding out what's important to them. Mm -hmm. Now, don't be surprised if when you call said listing agent, they're not that experienced at maybe they've never listed a house before. They haven't listed that many houses before. And maybe they really don't have the drill down on their seller. Maybe they really don't know what the seller's hot buttons. And in that case, you're going to be a little bit operating on you know a deficit. But get as much information out of them as possible. And don't be surprised at all that the other prospective competing buyer offers did not even bother That's to right. speak with the seller. At the very least, what you've sort of done is you've gotten the seller to uh, the listing agent to realize that you're a nice, easy to work with person. Because from a listing agent's perspective, if they don't have a buyer for the property themselves, one of their greatest motivations is who's going to get them paid the quickest, let's be honest, and who's going to be the easiest to work with, whether they like you. So there's another little way for you to champion the uh, listing agent to be on to be your advocate when they're looking through the uh, you know assuming they have multiple um, offers. Point number four, Julie Harris. Yes, that's right. So back to lending for a second. If you are trying to compete and you are using an FHA loan or a VA loan, and there's anybody who's even just conventional, you're probably going to lose. Yep. Okay? Because the the stigma around it of having low money down, maybe being risky, you have lower ratios. Most people know that, okay? And if they don't, it's easy to Google and find out, should I take FHA or conventional? So try to convert your FHA and VA buyers because most of the time they're doing those loans because they have low money down. Now, let's be very careful on this. This is more advanced lender information. Yeah. The lenders usually, so lenders get money based on the back end of the loan. That's how they make their commission. And ready for this, listeners? Some of the government-backed loans are the most profitable to the lenders, but some of the government-backed loans are also most onerous to the, to the sellers. In other words, and uh, frankly, the sellers, if they have a listing agent that's a little bit educated, is going to want to prefer accepting an offer, assuming there's financing on an, uh, from a uh, borrower that is not using you know, FHA, VA uh, financing. Now, here's where the gotcha comes in. Sometimes your, F, your lender will flip the borrower who could qualify for conventional to FHA, VA, and that's going to make it so your borrower, your buyer, borrower, then becomes less competitive in the eyes of the listing agent in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful on that. There is a FHA, VA appraisal and uh, that's going to be, you know, happen on properties that will kill deals. That is the other can of worms, right? People live in fear that listing agents hate FHA, FHA VA appraisals right. because the appraiser actually has about as much control as a home inspector does to say actually more because they do. it's attached to the lender. And that gets assigned yeah. to that house forever. It's like a sort of Damocles. I think it's a year or six yeah, months. Yeah, it's no, no bueno. Right. So a listing agent yeah. who has uh, who has options between a great offer that's conventional or a non-FHA and a great offer that's coming from FHA VA, they're going to take the other offer, I Just promise you. Just about every time. I, I, when we took we did, sold real were, estate, remember there were also extra seller fees and there were all guys, kinds they, of extra stuff. They can ding you in these appraisals, and it doesn't even matter. You can go in and try to write a FHA VA offer with that appraisal. It doesn't matter. You're not the if things gonna get appraised, but the appraisal will come back saying like all these little nitpicky things that maybe even the buyer doesn't care about being fixed in the house prior to and close. The buyer can't even say I don't care. We don't need to do that. It's right. not up to them. In it's those deals. exactly. You guys see how sellers don't like these types of offers. Yeah. I mean, they'll go out and they'll see if all the little concrete slabs to the sidewalk walking up to the front door, if one's sticking up a little bit, they're going to say level it. Guardrails. Guard remember, remember when we had to have the seller cut a, a little door to the crawl space inside of a cabinet in the kitchen? Nobody has ever in the history of that house used the crawl space. But the FHA appraiser said there had to be access. Yeah, crazy times. Yeah, and we put it in the cabinet so they didn't ruin the nice hardwood floors. Exactly. Crazy so times. Remember we yeah. told you that next point, which is point number okay, so whatever point we're on. Which five, I think. Five. Okay, yep. so here's the thing. If you don't want to deal with as much of this, learn how to find inventory where you don't actually have to compete. That's new construction. That's always the easy button. You know, it depends on the price range and what they like. Uh, new construction expired even going back two or three years. Uh, for sale by owners and your own database. I'm seeing a ton of deals done 
where the agent's finding the match within their own database and doing both sides. Rental properties, that's yeah. another one. There's a lot of disenfranchised, you know, mom and pops out there. They're VRBOs. looking to unload their VRBOs. Mm -hmm. You could have, believe it or not, notice of defaults. You could have notice of defaults that could become officially, I mean, there's going to be pre right yeah. pre-foreclosure type stuff. So there are a lot of different yes. ways to go about this. But the thing is, is if your modus of operandi for presenting your buyers is essentially writing an offer and sending over the DocuSign or whatnot and expecting the listing agent to get back with you, and then the listing agent doesn't even respond or they respond to some sort of pat thank you except it's someone else's offer, and you get pissed off that listing agent, don't get pissed off the listing nope. agent. You just didn't work the offer enough. That's right. It's, it is your fault if that's happening. It yep. is, especially if it's happening multiple times. How many times do you have to lose? I'll tell you what it usually takes, the client firing them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I remember, Julie, when we sold real estate. Now, granted, it was a thousand years ago, <laughs> and people did still use typewriters. Back before, what did we use, fax machines? Do you remember in high school when you took typing class, and I even do. before their computers, you literally used a, 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 a typewriter, typewriter with a ribbon? Yeah, people call that vintage decor now. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I call it a boat anchor. Right. But, you know, but the reality of it was, guys, is this market that we're experiencing now, it, for the most part, is going to be something that it's going to be the last hurrahs, you know, of the hottest sellers market probably in the history of all of our lifetimes, um, that we're going to be entering into another market. And now, with that said, there will be a lots of little spike ups in your market. You know, there's going to be bifurcation in your marketplace between houses that are essentially stuck in a downward slope, houses that are going to be still in a seller's market. You've got to have, you're going to have to learn to be more uh, uh, creative and more aggressive. We always talk about multiple tools in your toolbox when you're working with sellers. Well, you're going to need, and you obviously do need, the same set of tools when you're working with buyers. Just, well, not same set, but a different set. You've got to understand all the potential gotchas. And for those of you, again, who are getting frustrated because you're not getting your offers accepted, follow these five steps. It's not that difficult. And um, I have one more thing to say about yes, that. Yes, ma'am. There used to be a sixth step, which was writing the love letter to the listing yeah. uh, agent or the seller. Many uh, MLSs have banned that now. Yeah. So if you guys are still using that, especially our more experienced agents might still be doing that, make sure that it's legal to do that because you could get in trouble over that. I didn't even know that. They're banning letters that you're, the buyers would write to the listing agents. About, you know, I've been looking at 50 houses. I love your house because it's got the backyard for That's banned? Yeah. Why would that be banned? Well, you know, if they could ban coming soon, they might as well ban that too. I, I don't like it either because it was a competitive thing, you know? I mean, you've had clients that had all kinds of crazy perks offered to them that, that worked. Remember like the, I don't know, what some sports thing, one of your clients in- Yeah, in LA, in LA, there was uh, yeah, what there were listing agents that. going after these houses on the Bird Streets and you guys are out in uh, Beverly Hills, you know what I'm talking about. And I know of agents that were offering, you know, what would it be, track, side tickets to Lakers games to the seller if they yeah. if they not even accepted the offer but negotiated the offer we yeah. have people that still do automatic um what well, was it escalation called? clauses escalation so clauses my point. You can, well you go ahead you have that. time yeah so uh and there's different ways of doing this right? bonus point escalation clause escalation bonus point um and they're called different things acceleration clauses bonus uh you know basically where your client is willing to go X number of dollars higher than any other offer. Any other verified offer, yes. any other bona fide now, offer. They have to prove that right. it was, there was another you offer. You have to be careful with this right. because not every buyer has the chops to say, I'll go 20 grand over. It depends on the price range and what they're able to do Right. because they might actually have to do it. You and, cannot finance that in most cases. And if the house, so let's, let's just say where you see this typically okay. is on the upper end, right? Yes. So escalation clauses. So if the house is, let's say a million and a half, and let's say that the buyer is going to, the buyer is getting uh, financing and the financing is going to, you know, they're putting 25% down, but the house still has to appraise for them to get the mortgage and whatever. So and let's say the house appraises for a million and a half, the buyer then in order to get the house in contract, writes the offer and gets it accepted. Maybe they have an escalation clause in there. You know, the escalation clause says the buyer will, uh, you know, pay $10,000 more than the highest verified price up to a particular number. And then they have to prove that they actually had a verified contract, that kind of thing. Well, the difference between the appraised price 
and what the house finally goes in contract and that's going to have to come in the form of cash it's not going to be financeable was julie's point so you're going to be very careful that you know not only the borrowers you know essentially emotional and financial thresholds but also working very closely with the lender one of the things that julie and i did and we suggest all of our coaching clients do this as well is you have three different lenders that you work with and the reason we suggest you work with three different lenders, they can be with the same company, but they have to specialize in different things. So look, think about you guys. All of you have a preference to the type of price range you will work within. And the price range is typically the price range in which the house in which you live. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but most agents only sell houses in their price range in lower where they live. They have somehow have the psychological mooring line that keeps them from never really feeling comfortable going up market or beyond the price point in which they actually are living. Kind of a fascinating trend. Look to see if you're following that yourself because it's all in your head. You can sell anything in any price range. The sellers don't really uh, care. But the same thing is true. That same funky psychology is also going to be true with the lenders. So if you're working with a lender who them themselves are only you know living in a house that's whatever price range, say a lower end price range for your marketplace, and you bring them one of your gold plated upper end you know super fantastic uh, luxury buyers, that uh, lender and that. Uh, borrower is probably they're probably not going to gel that probably is a mismatch for all kinds of different reasons so same thing goes true on the very high end if you bring a very high end borrower uh, to a lender who's going to essentially only be you know feeling comfortable working with the low end borrower you guys get the gist of what I'm getting at here so what we always did is we had three different lenders and we've talked about this in the podcast before now we didn't have the luxury of just working with one mortgage company that had three different you know brokers or lenders that we could feel comfortable comfortable referring to. So we actually used three different companies. And the thir- the first company we used was an FHA VA approved lender. Now, there's there are two types of lenders. Uh, so how do I explain this? And I'll tell you the name of the company. And I got an email from him last time I uh, mentioned his name, so I'll do it again. Mark Yerke at Yerke Mortgage was one of the best FHA VA lenders, if not the best, when Julie and I sold real estate. And we haven't sold real estate in Columbus, Ohio since like 1990, okay? But when we sold real estate there, uh, hold on, is that true or did I just get my dates wrong? I got my dates wrong. <laughs> since like the late 90s, since 98, 99, sometime in there. You know, when you get older, guys, you kind of get your date, your decades mixed up. You'll understand when you get there. <laughs> uh, so the reason that we liked Mark is because he was a direct lender for FHA VA, which very few borrowers or lenders are, which means they needed to have like their own warehouse line. They needed to have more skin in the game. When you're a lender at the level that Mark Yerke and his company was, you had to be subject yourself and your company to like these regular audits from the government. It was not easy to have achieved the status that Mark company has and it was a family run mortgage company and they did a fantastic job and so as a result of that when we had a borrower that was a good fit for that type of loan we took him to mark he always got him approved now here's what we found out through experience we would take the same borrower to a before we discovered mark to a different lender and the lender would say they could do fha va but they weren't a direct endorsed fha va lender so what they were doing is they were usually they were trying to get the they were taking the loan to somebody like mark and then they were marking that loan up you know adding more revenue profit to that loan and then trying to get our borrowers to basically go about that so the borrower was better served going directly to mark but this other lender mortgage broker didn't say they weren't a direct FHA VA um, lender and maybe at the time we weren't smart enough to know how to you know know the difference which is probably the case and so we're trying to save you guys from experiencing the same hardship make sure you're working with a lender who's a direct endorsed government you know Yerky style level lender and if they're all over the country you can go I think you can go to like FHA's website and get a list of actually endorsed approved lenders and work directly with them don't go through brokers go through these guys a broker is basically goes to their computer they you know put in the rough criteria of what your borrower is going to be qualified for based on their credit score and whatnot and then they look at all these different offers from different mortgage banks from different lenders and then they show what the commission on the loan is going to be and all the rest of it mortgage brokers for the most part and they're i'm not criticizing i'm just saying that's how they go about doing it and so what a mortgage broker might do is they might take 
take your borrower who would be better served with that FHA, VA, Mark Yerke style loan, and they might push them towards something that's going to be more profitable for them, but going to require more down payment from your borrower. Now, your borrower might not have more down payment to put down on the loan, thus your borrower doesn't buy and you lose the deal. This is really important why you understand the differences in all these lenders. So the middle grade lender, that's the, so we had three lenders, like I said. So we had the FHA VA lender, and then we had someone that was in the middle. The someone in the middle was a was a broker, right? So they could do they they were a chameleon. They could work comfortably within a certain price range. And and, and when we were selling real estate, that price range was usually about two fifty to maybe about six hundred, somewhere in there. They never lost deals. They were very responsive. The borrowers, our buyers, and our sellers always you know gave great feedback. The whole thing very comfortable. Then there was this upper end lend, uh, lender that we would use for anything over like 600, 650, all the way up to wherever the top was. And he was perfect for them. He did not want to bother with anybody that was less than 600 grand. He played golf all the time. Whenever we called him, he was on the golf course. He was very responsive, but the borrowers loved him because he was just like them. <laughs> okay. And so that was a perfect personality fit. And as a result of that, we never had lender problems. And the other thing is, is we always, let all the lenders know that they weren't our only lender. And that kept them from taking us from gra for granted or our business for granted, kept them frosty, made it so that they would always take care of our borrowers and they would never send us cheese ball lender letters. They knew better than to do that. And, you know, that makes it, that will save a tremendous amount of time when you're working at speed. So if you've got a lender team, like I just described, that's working with you and you've got a borrower that shows up on your radar today, a, you know, a buyer, maybe they don't have anything to sell and you can flip them to one of these lenders and these lenders know that they have to give you a real lender's letter, not some boilerplate, boilerplate BS lender's letter. You can then hypothetically get that borrower in contract maybe later today. You guys get the point? You have to have a lending team around you that you trust and that's gonna be what the listing agent and the sellers are gonna look for as well. So hopefully all this makes sense guys. This all goes to the bottom line of today's podcast, which is speed. In this marketplace, you have to be fast. There's no doing it tomorrow or even doing it later. You have to do it now. Otherwise, the borrower is going to see that you are not acting in their best best interest and not being urgent. And they're going to be, frankly, they'll fire you. They, you. They'll ghost you. You won't hear from them again. They won't open your emails. They'll just completely and totally ghost you and work with somebody else. I'm sorry if that's happened to you, um, but it's, it's usually because they felt like you were not Johnny on the spot with urgency. That's what they want right now because they're all operating over, on, you know, on, based on uh, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. That's what's motivating this market right now. Fear of missing out on the low interest rates. Fear of missing out on the newest listing. That's what's motivating these buyers. Until that shifts, which it inevitably will, that's what they're going to expect from you in terms of your urgency. One of our Harris rules is there is no drip campaign. There is no different ways to treat differing leads. There are no, it's furiously fast lead follow up. And our rule for a listing, uh, if you come across that someone has to ha uh, sell a house, a lot of you guys overanalyze what your follow up campaign should be. Here's what it is if the seller has to sell, you have to list it. It, in, until one of the two things happen. They list it with you or somebody else or they file a restraining order against you. That's the level of urgency and that's a joke. Just keep that in mind. But I'm trying to impress upon you how important it is to be urgent. If you have two things in real estate, if you have energy and enthusiasm, I guess that's two, and you have urgency, even as you're learning skills, you're going to win because people are going to be attracted to that. That's the antithesis of how most agents and frankly, most business people act. Urgency, energy, and enthusiasm. Learn your skills along the way. Those are my two takeaways for you guys today. If you need me for anything, if you want to talk uh, with us about joining our eXp Realty family, I encourage you to do so. As you guys know, if you're paying attention to the news, eXp is absolutely on the ascension. It's unbelievably exciting to see this company. They're now, they opened, just opened up in five different countries. Uh, they're adding literally thousands of agents per year. At the same time, other brokerages are losing agents. They're becoming more profitable. Please do consider uh, taking a look at eXp. I made it super simple for you. All you have to do is text the word eXp, just those three letters, eXp to 31996. Text the word eXp to 31996. Go ahead and do that now. Text the word eXp to 31996. If you guys want to talk with me directly about joining our eXp family, just go ahead and this would be you being um, working with Julie and I directly at, at, at eXp as part of our group. Go ahead and text me directly at 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. 
This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.